Sure. So thanks everybody for being with us. I'm Chris Stepanuk and uh, Ashley Eaton is just talking. Uh, we're with Lake Champlain Sea Grant and if you have not joined us for one of these events this semester, uh, this is part of a stormwater education methods course that we are offering at the University of Vermont and it is teaching undergraduate students and teachers, uh, in-service teachers, how to use a curriculum that was put together by uh, one of our staff people a few summers ago and we've revised based on using that with a, a cohort of teachers, including Ruth Beecher, who will be our speaker here in a minute, um, last fall. And the curriculum is to introduce upper elementary, middle and high school students to understanding what stormwater is and understanding how that works within a community on their school campuses, and then engaging in stewardship projects to help um, mitigate stormwater from oftentimes the school campus. And so this is the second to last day of our series of presenters this fall. Uh, we do have one more presenter on December 7th uh, talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion as related to green infrastructure. So we hope you'll be able to join us on the December 7th. Um, but for today, we are going to get to learn again from uh, Ruth Beecher, who's a retired educator from Robinson Elementary School in Starksboro, Vermont. And she was one of the about seven or eight teachers who participated with us last fall in the first iteration of this course uh, using the curriculum with her students and as the case may be through COVID and the shutdown that we all faced uh, last spring. So Ruth is going to share with us her experience with this uh, curriculum with her students and how she accomplished some pretty awesome things during the shutdown. So I'll, I will turn it over to Ruth. We will have questions at the end. Uh, you have a Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, or you can also use the chat. <clears throat> I'll turn it over to Ruth. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Glad to hear, see you. I mean, I don't even see you. <laughs> I know you're there, though. I see your words. <laughs> oh, hi, Chris. So anyway, I retired this June after 37 years in education, the last 30 of which were as a classroom teacher at Robinson Elementary School in Starksboro. And first of all, I'd like to say I have the greatest respect and admiration for all of you who are teaching during, during this pandemic. So hats off to you. So I took Ashley and Chris's stormwater education class beginning last summer and through the fall. And it was new subject matter for me. So it was really fun to learn myself and then to teach my fifth and sixth grade students. So I used their soaking up stormwater curriculum while teaching my students. And this was enormously effective as a framework. And I really liked how it provided background information, which was all what we were learning during the class. It had links, hands-on activities, pre and post assessments, I was easily able to use the curriculum as is or adapt as necessary, which I did need to do for my grade level, or skip if the material was too advanced and still have a very effective curriculum. I was also able to easily intertwine a related unit that I needed to teach incorporating the Lewis Creek environment in which the Robinson School sits. So now I get a share screen. I'm out of practice. Can you see it? Yep, that looks great. Okay, good. So I'm going to tell you about the work we did while showing slides that my students use to give a culminating presentation at the end of our fall study. And then I'll discuss our final end product, which is a pollinator rain garden. So this picture that's showing is the previous year's Three Sisters Garden. So that's our garden site. It's right off of Route 116, the front of Robinson School. Starksboro is in between Hinesburg and Bristol. So this fall, um, well, it was last fall. Well, first of all, the, the presentation is divided into three sections. That's how the kids taught the uh, rest of Robinson School. So they learned about stormwater education and then taught the group about pervious and impervious surfaces, stormwater runoff and storm drains. And then we also informed everyone about the Lewis Creek watershed where they made connections between stormwater runoff and the Lewis Creek watershed and why we should care. 
And then finally, we enlightened everybody with information about green stormwater infrastructures and what our class is doing to help. So these are some students in front of the school. The garden is just to the, to the left over here. And they really learned about what pervious means, what impervious means. And we did a site analysis of the school locating pervious and impervious sur surfaces. And we have a lot of grassy playground and also other places where they could see the stormwater was being absorbed. The next section, the kids really presented about what is stormwater runoff and how the storm drains collect runoff and drain into Lewis Creek. We located four storm drains around our school. This one's right in front of our classroom, which borders Route 116, which is right along here. My classroom's right over here. The garden's actually right over here. So it's all really close by. So that was one storm drain. And then we have one in the back parking lot. So Parsonage Road is over here. 116 runs along here. And all the cars park over here and here. And this slopes down into this site. So this slopes and this slopes. Can you see my arrow? Well, hopefully you can. And yes, can. Yep. Okay, good. So that's the second storm drain we located. And I had the kids find them. I didn't tell them where they were. This one is the, that's the back parking lot. The one we just saw is behind that car. So this one's in between the stone wall and the maple tree. And there's a pavilion up here. So now this also, all the water slopes down the hill on both sides here and here. And then the fourth one is on the back playground. So the one you just saw was over here. And so this slopes down here and comes into this storm drain. And then the kids presented about the Lewis Creek watershed. This is literally in the backyard of our school. The school is right over here. So we can walk down Parsonage Road, hop, skip, and a jump, and you're at Lewis Creek. So we learned a lot about what a watershed is and how all the water flows into a water. That's what a watershed is, and it flows into stream, river, lake, or ocean. And they made connections that that water then flows into Lake Champlain. So we went down to Lewis Creek a lot to take notes and learn about the riparian zone, food chains and food webs. And we were able to go many different days because it's right in our backyard. And I have a self-contained, had a self-contained classroom, the exception of math. So I could base it on the weather and just say, come on, we're going out, which they never complained about. And also during the Lewis Creek watershed part, we were very fortunate to have our friend, neighbor, who lives right down the road, Chris Runcy, who just joined us too. So hi, Chris. Um, and she taught us about macroinvertebrates that are sensitive to stream health. So these three are the caddisfly, stonefly, and the mayfly, because they're sensitive to stream health. So Chris also is the coordinator for the Four Winds program. So she did an amazing pup show with some of my students, and we taught, they taught the rest of the class about the macroinvertebrates. And then we went down to the creek and did some kick netting. And the kids learned that macroinvertebrates are part of a food chain. So if they, they could really picture a fish eating a macroinvertebrate, which maybe a great blue heron could then eat the fish. And then they learned that whatever pollutants were in the macroinvertebrate end up in other critters too. So with Chris, we counted the number of sensitive to stream health macroinvertebrates that we found, and there were 17. We also counted all of the macros that we found, which was 41. And then we divided 17 by 41 and got a percentage of 41. So 41% shows that our section of Lewis Creek has good water health, at least for now. And they learned an awful lot with Chris, who's using the EPT method to model this for us. The next part of our presentation was how our stormwater runoff and the Lewis Creek watershed connected and why we should care. So luckily during this coursework, 
we had some really nice rainstorms so the kids could watch it coming down and see where it's going. And while they were learning about stormwater runoff picking up pollutants like gas, oil, other chemicals from our car, plastics from litter, bacteria from dog feces, and they could see it traveling across the impervious surfaces. So they also learned that when we use fertilizer or pesticides that can be harmful when it gets washed into our storm drains. So this is the, both of these are taken from my classroom. So that's the window that borders 116. And this one borders the garden. So just on the other side of this box is where the garden is. So they had a really good view of water coming down the roof, the walkway, and going right into where the garden is and into that storm drain that also borders 116. And then we were so fortunate, well, not really fortunate, but they got to see the effects of that huge storm on Halloween. So the weeks when school got back into session, we went for a walk and this is the field in between the school and Lewis Creek. And they could actually see where the water surged down and they, we talked about how whatever fertilizer or pesticides were being used in this field is going right down into Lewis Creek. So they saw firsthand how this kind of a storm surge with flooding in some areas brings even more pollutants to our waterways. And this was more that they saw after the storm surge, they could see that the water level was higher, wider, and caused all this river silt to come up onto the bank. This is where they were taking notes from those pictures I showed you at the beginning. So they just couldn't believe it. They saw firsthand evidence of a storm surge. And then we started learning about green water sorry, green stormwater infrastructures, GSIs. And we actually kicked off this unit with this field trip. And that's Ashley right there. And this is at the Rubenstein lab, the backside of the echo center. So we kicked off the unit with this, and then we referred to this trip throughout the whole unit. So they had this little taste of what, what, are, what green stormwater infrastructures are, or GSIs. So Ashley taught us all about how they have a rain garden, rocks for drainage, a bioretention pond and tall grasses with deep roots to help collect stormwater, sorry, to collect rainwater and stormwater runoff to help slow the flow before it goes into Lake Champlain, which they could see is right over there. And the parking lot slopes in, so they learned all about how to do a site map as well, which helped us when we did it at our own school. And then there's Ashley again with all my students. And then we did this really cool experiment that we learned about in the stormwater curriculum where we used models for natural curriculum simulating a community environment where we these bottles have holes in the bottom so they would, could pour water right over these communities before it was developed. And then we did the same experiment using these surfaces, impervious surfaces that come with development, such as pavement, parking lots, and sidewalks. And then we did the same experiment again, using the green practices that we learned about GSIs with stone pathways, rooftop gardens, permeable pavements, bioswales and curb cuts, and rain gardens or bioretention ponds. And this was a little chart I made to go with the kit that came with the stormwater curriculum. And they just couldn't remember what the green practices were. So this really helped them remember what each piece was referring to. And so they really learned through this experiment that the water flow was slowed because we measured the amounts of water in the water body, which is that part, as well as the other parts of the community. And then they recorded the data, figured percentages of the stormwater collected and then we had many discussions where they compared results and they all found out that it makes a difference using GSIs such as these rain gardens, rocks, permeable pavement, bioretention ponds and more, the amount of stormwater heading into our water bodies is less. Then we talked about what are we gonna do 
to help try to slow the flow of the runoff. And so we decided to plant a new garden. So they went outside and measured the current plot. And we talked about getting plants with wet feet. So they would have deep roots to help absorb extra rainwater and stormwater runoff. And we had a lot of fun watching the birds all winter and squirrels too would come up to the sunflowers. So we left those up, which was really neat. And then we, for the pollinator garden, we were looking at plants from our region that also were pollinators for our Lewis Creek watershed connections and we wanted them to be perennials so they would come back every year. We also wanted plants that are Vermont natives so they wouldn't need as much care and or watering or fertilizing. So they just had a great time doing this unit and we're very excited. And then we were one, I had a grant already secured from the Terry Shattuck Education Foundation for planting the garden and then COVID hit. So I wasn't sure what, what we were gonna do because that was from March all the way through June. So I thought we'd have to abandon the, the rain garden project. My principal, Adora Frazier, suggested having half hour family slots with masks and safe distancing to plant. So I asked the kids if they'd wanna do that. And of course they did. And then I asked their parents if they'd wanna drive them over in half hour slots. So they did too. And that was including three homeschoolers who joined my class for field trips and special projects. So I went to the Rockydale Nursery in Bristol for the plants and Martin's Hardware also in Bristol for the mulch. And Matt, one of our maintenance marvels, rototilled the plot. And there were all kinds of, um, from the time when it was rototilled to the time when we were ready to plant, all these little sunflowers popped up from the previous year's garden. So I went out and rescued them and we had tons and tons of them. So then over the course of the first week of June, all but three of these kids came to help plant the garden. And one of them who couldn't come, we did a Zoom planting. So he did it vicariously, which was really fun. And then each student planted a perennial pollinator, Vermont native, except black eyed Susans are not Vermont natives. And there were enough of the sunflowers so that everybody could plant one as well as take some home to plant at home. So that was fun to see pe parents shared pictures over the summer. So this is the actual garden after it was planted in June, July, August, September. So I, I would go down and weed every other week or so. October, and here it is now in November. So I created a slideshow of the actual garden planting, which Ashley's going to pull up for us. And then if you have any questions or comments or connections, it's always fun to share what other people are doing too. So now I stop sharing. Great, okay, I'm just gonna click on this and get this started. Grab your coat and get your hat. Leave your worries on the doorstep. Just direct your feet. To the sunny side of the street, don't you hear that bitter path? And that happy tune is your step. Life can be so sweet on the sunny side of the street. I used to walk in the shade with those blues on parade. Not afraid, cause it's rover, crossed over. If I never had a set, I'd be rich as Rockefeller. Gold dust at my feet on the sunny side of the street. I used to 
crossed over if I never had a set I'd be rich as Rockefeller gold just at my feet on the sunny side of the Great. Ruth, do you want to say anything to follow up that video? It was super nice to see the kids in person after teaching from a computer for so long. It was really heartwarming and just so special. And the first thing I did when the first kid came was I started to go up to hug him. I'm like, oh, I can't do that. So it was just really, really nice. And I think they had a great time too. And we're, we're working on having um, an interpretive sign put up. So that's something that maybe we could have installed for June for the one year anniversary. So that's something that would be really cool to get all the kids back and take a picture of the post result. But I heard such great compliments throughout the summer where kids would go by and stop and see it. And it was just really, really fun to have as, a, as an end product of a great unit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when Ruth first shared with us this video, Ashley and I uh, immediately said, oh, we, this is amazing to have something positive that resulted during the, the COVID shutdown that was really um, challenging in so many ways. And you figured out that you figured out a way of how to get those kids back and finishing up what they had been working on earlier when they were in class is just, just phenomenal. Very, very exciting. Thank you. And the, the creativity of the Zoom planting and getting <laughs> students in it. And you can tell from the video how much students enjoyed it and they definitely took pride and experience in planting that and I feel like it showed in the end result you know just watching them plant each of their plants knowing that they had been there from the start of the project and had kind of planned each piece um, you know meticulously throughout the school year so um, that was you. really lovely. And having the sunflowers because the the kids that were in sixth grade planted the previous year's garden so they got to take a piece of that home and one of them lives just down the road from me so I could see her plants are, were just like over 10 feet tall. It was just really cool to, right. to have that connection too. It kind of took away from the, the garden a little bit in the front, the pollinator part, but we, we didn't care. It just looked really cool. 
So now we have this garden and it needs to be maintained. So I've been doing it. I have more, more time now that I'm retired so I can do that. But I was just curious if other people have suggestions on maintaining a rain garden or other projects, a biosphere, whatever you've made. And I'm also really curious what other people are, are doing for projects. If that's something people want to share about, or if you have any questions. So we do, we do have one question in the, in the Q and A and we can also, Ashley has the right to open up the um, microphones for people. If you want to answer Ruth with actual voice instead of typing, if you would like. Yeah, that's great. So if you want to, I'm going to ask, Sarah has a question in the chat box, but if you want to put your hand up in the participants, I can see you and I'll, um, I'll allow you to unmute yourself and you can answer um, Ruth's question as well. Great. So first, we'll just kick things off with Sarah's question. So actually, um, Sarah, I'm going to allow you to talk. It looks like you just tossed your hand up. So do you want to ask your question? But you're, yeah. So, so we don't hear you, but I'm not quite sure why, because I can see that you're not muted. Well, I'll ask, um, Sarah, I'll ask the first part, and then if you um, are able to get your mic and you have a piece you want to add on. So Sarah's asking, I'm wondering if you saw any impacts of this curriculum beyond your class, if they shared it with friends and family, et cetera. I'm, I'm sure they did. I mean, there's several of the kids that live in the village or down a road that borders the cornfield. And one of the little boys was just really surprised to know, we learned that they use Roundup in that field. So he was like, I live here, I breathe this air. So that was one of the things, if I were still there, maybe I still can do this somehow, but to make ongoing connections with this unit to try to help the kids mm. promote what they've learned and say, look, we shouldn't be using Roundup here. It's going right into Lewis Creek. Mm -hmm. So that was something that I know followed through and some of his cousins live in the same neighborhood and somebody else lives on the other side, but close enough to smell or, or have the effects of, of things in the air and also seeing it go onto the ground and into the waterways. Um, and I, I definitely got a lot of feedback from parents of what a what an impact it made. So I really love to get the interpretive sign put up so then it could have some longer term impacts as well. Yeah. Does that answer your question? I think that was great. Do you want, uh, Colleen had her hand up before. I'm not sure if who's who asked the question, but maybe if we let Colleen talk and then if that's not her question, we can go to the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds good, Colleen. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. So congratulations on completing a successful project and for getting the families directly involved. That's important to extend that learning audience. Uh, I had two quick questions. One was, I was wondering if you observed any runoff leaving your garden site this fall when you were working around it, maybe after a rain, or did it appear to contain uh, the runoff as you expected? And the second question is, I was curious if anyone from Lewis Creek Association either joined you or knew about the project as well. So the Lewis Creek Association, Chris Runcy, I don't know if you saw her doing the macro invertebrate. Yes. Part. She is on the Lewis Creek Association, so yes. Um, Great. And as far as the garden, this the current garden, the pollinator garden was just planted this June. So the previous year's garden was a three sisters garden and that actually was able to trap a lot of the water as well. So I think because we made a garden there, I, that was my first two, these past two years were my first two at that classroom. I was in three, four on the other side of the building before that and first grade before that. So I'd always had a garden, but it was always in the back of the school or at our community garden plot. So I said, well, I guess I'm not going to do one. And then I'm like, I can't not have a garden. I've always had a garden. So that's when we planted the three sisters garden and then just a Vermont native plant pollinator rain garden this past year. So it was actually, I think a really good site to, to have a garden because it is collecting a lot of the rainwater, but hopefully with the Vermont pollinator plants with wet roots, they can 
gather even more water because we've had bigger rainfalls. And so some of it could go off into the walkway, which is really close, close mm -hmm. to it. So I think Great. that was really helpful. And then as far as how long the unit took, I combined it with, oh, that the next person. I think that's the next person, but oh, sorry. Next person. That's okay. Yeah. Thanks, Colleen. Yeah. <laughs> so, so everybody knows what the next question Ruth was gonna answer. Uh, they, the person said, when you first started planning this unit, how long did, it, did you think it would take and how long did it actually take? So that's a tough one because I don't always know. And I mentioned earlier, I have had a self-contained classroom. So I have the, the benefit of if something takes longer or less time, it's okay. Um, I'm trying to think back. Because we were doing, as we were learning with Ashley and Chris, I was teaching concurrently in my classroom. And it was, we were done that part of it. It probably started in September and went into December. So a few months, but I also combined it with another unit, the Lewis Creek Watershed Environmental Unit. So if you just did the stormwater education, I mean, you can make it take as long or as little as you wanted really, but I would say a, definitely a good two months, but it's not doing it every day. So I'm gonna post in the chat, the link to the curriculum. So if, if people wanna see what that looks like, that is available on that, this website. Um, so you can see the kinds of activities that Ruth was probably doing with her class. And th the the way it's set up is there are um, pre like learning, like she explained, like what's a watershed, what is storm water, what is non-point source pollution. And, and then there are uh, some calculations and monitoring activities. And again, there you pick and choose. It's a choose your own adventure. Uh, and then there's the stewardship piece uh, of it. So there's, it's, it, is in, it takes a lot of pages, but it doesn't necessarily have to take a lot of classes, depending on what you choose as your adventure. Are there other questions? And I also supplemented it with anything that came up in the news, like I'd snip out articles and we would talk about it from the Addison Independent, which is our local newspaper, and make it relatable to whatever was happening was always something going on so with that that made it fun too mm -hmm. i think we actually added that as an activity oh, into good. the curriculum as a result of, of you doing that we're like what a great idea to oh, nice. link to local news yeah I'm trying to think what else did i do well having well-timed rainstorms was very helpful <laughs> but being able to drop everything and go watch or not everyone would wear raincoats in fifth and sixth grade, so I couldn't always go out in the rain, but they could see from that, our classroom window. And then I think they noticed it when they were other places. They started, like after our field trip to, with, with Ashley to the Rubenstein lab, they started thinking more about it and like being in awe of what is there, which was helpful. And having the, the paper for the site maps was really cool. So they never really thought about it before. So that was a really cool activity from that curriculum. Did you have a planting plan for the, did the students help decide which plant was going to go where in the garden or did they just pick a spot when they got there and said that's, I'm claiming that place? My original plan was that they would do that based on when the plants, like how high they get and when they bloom and what colors they are to spread it all out. But we couldn't do that with COVID so easily. So yes, I made a plan. So the taller ones are in the, the back and moving on up and I tried to separate the colors but we messed up once um, so two plants I was going to have on either side two of the same got side by side and same thing with the other side but I, I bought these well with the grant money these um, plant markers that you can write on so I had put all of those out so it was that which actually I put in tongue to tongue depressors and then the kids would write on the markers the plant markers what their name is and what plant they planted and the date. So those are all still there. I need to pull them out before the ground freezes, but oh, yeah. I do have a map of who planted what, where, and then next year it'll look differently. I don't know if the sunflowers will pop up again, but those were really fun to have. Um, they were heirloom seeds from our three sisters garden. Oh, that's very cool. So. Chris, would you like to, to ask your question out loud? We can give you the mic if you want, or we can read it if you would like. Oh, sure. That's fine. Um, Thanks. I, 
Yeah, Ruth, I just was wondering what um, individual projects the children did, the um, students did over the course of this year long project, really. We did it mostly as a whole class. So we didn't really do individual projects with this because it, we then had, I had another project going on starting in January, a phenology project, which we had started with Shelburne Farms from a, a field ecology field trip in November, which then morphed into this whole project where they came to our school to, so the kids studied different trees and then we were going to do observations every week. So we started in January when there's no changes. And then of course, COVID happened right in March when the changes started happening. So I thought I had to abandon that project as well. So then decided, well, we'll just study it at home. So everyone picked a tree near their house to study. So that was an individual project where they learned about a tree or a shrub near their house. And then we shared what changes were happening every week. And then the people from Shelburne Farms joined us via Zoom. So we, we kept that project going too. That was where the individual project came in. And then they all did, um, as part of the whole district-wide COVID learning in 5-6, they all chose some kind of a project to do to sh regarding the environment. So there was ocean health, stream health. So they carried it on. It was amazing, the different projects they had then. And I think having all this background information and projects really helped spur them on. They were, they were pretty interested in that. Did that answer yeah. your question? I think yeah. their favorite was probably planting the garden because they could yeah. be back at school, even though they couldn't interact with other kids, but just being there and having a hands-on project and then they could still see the garden. I'd say that was their favorite. Probably school ending was their favorite favorite. <laughs> thanks, Chris. Great, thanks, Chris. Oh, wait, Chris, I would tell you, not just because it's you, but that whole macro invertebrate field trip that with the kick netting and all of that, that, that was a real highlight of the unit, as well as the field trip to Echo. Well, they had, we had the Rubenstein lab and then Echo combined. So they really liked those hands-on field trips which was fantastic. They also enjoyed going down to the creek and writing in their journals. And we came up, told them you can write whatever you want, mm. but try to you know, observe the changes that we see every week. And we had lots of poetry, we had scientific diagrams, we had people writing and then researching more when they got back to the classroom and just like what they're seeing and feeling and hearing as well. So that, that was a really nice part of the project too. Yeah, that's great. And something that I'm noticing as you're describing this project and how you implemented it with your students, Ruth, is some of the practices that you're sharing that you kind of ingrained with your group over the course of this project since it was such a, such kind of a long term unit. So you're talking about doing observation work and kind of weaving this into the other pieces. I'm curious what recommendations you'd have for teachers that are looking to start a project like this, um, where they are kind of building a unit where they're going to eventually take it to a stewardship project or something a little bit bigger, some type of implementation piece. What do you think like was the, the, the key practice or practices that you'd say definitely do this, this was super successful with my class um, and, I, and maybe was even crucial to the success of the, the project implementation? Well, I think first of all, giving yourself permission to use a framework, change it as needed, adapt as needed and to ask for help. So that like getting that the kit for the stormwater experiment, I couldn't make it to Burlington to pick it up. So Ashley and Chris helped get it into my neighborhood. And then we, it, that was really helpful. And then the whole thing with the macro invertebrates, Chris Stepanek was going to come in, but then Chris Runcy is right there. So they, I mean, everybody's just so helpful. So making it be a team effort and taking the class at the same time was fantastic. The other thing that is important to me is to make sure to incorporate what you need to teach anyway. So I, that's why I combined it with the Lewis Creek environmental unit, but also it just went so well, hand in hand, having it be right there in their, their neighborhood. And then 
the other thing I was going to say, I just forgot what it was. But giving yourself permission to change things and ask for help when needed. Oh, I know what it was. Um, having a self-contained classroom, I could just say, look, we're, we have this plan, but we're not going to do that. We're going to go outside. Or it's raining now, just stop doing math. No, not math. Math was the one thing I couldn't change. But stop doing writing or whatever it was and go look out the window and go look in the hallway too. So those kind of things was, were really helpful to take advantage of, of just nature and what was happening. So that's a big thing for me, just to be flexible and honoring the kids and doing the experiment more than once. That, that was fantastic. We did it at least four times. The first time we did it, I modeled it with them watching, which was how we learned in class. And then or maybe we did it with Ashley. I can't remember that and Chris, but um, we did it more than once. So then they felt really comfortable doing it. So having giving yourself time to do things more than once and then talk about it and sharing results and it's okay to make a mess. Here's some towels to clean it up. <laughs> so those kind of things really helped make it workable and fun too. One of the things with the curriculum is it was, it was written for a little bit older students. So Ruth really was kind of sent out there on your own to, to figure out you know, how, to, how to adapt it. And your example that you just gave of having you demonstrate once and then the students would do it the next time around isn't necessarily how our high school teachers were implementing it with their classes, though I think some of them could have done that as well. But um, in any case, it, you know, it's every teacher, no matter what we write for curricula, there's always a unique experience of what's happening within a class for a teacher, what kinds of time you have available. And so, you know, that's one of the things we tried to create it with what are the linkages to the next generation science standards and here's the framework that you could use and you can do it in the way that you need to and and I love seeing and learning from the teachers uh, who how you did it because it gives us a way of saying you know either ideas when we're conversing with teachers in the future or as I told you we've updated the curriculum based on all of your feedback from last year to try to make it better for the next teachers uh, to be using and implementing uh, with their classes. So I appreciate that. The other thing that um, there's a, a pre-assessment, which is the same as the post-assessment and the language was really difficult for my students. I handed it out and they're all just sitting there like, mm, they had no idea what it meant. So then I realized they're not gonna write anything. So then I said, this, these are the things you're going to be learning. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to write, I don't know. But you can write what you think it is, but if you don't know, you can write, I don't know. And that's, that opened it up. And they all started writing what they thought or just, I don't know. And they're like, sorry, I don't know. I'm like, that's okay, you don't, you don't have to be sorry. And then when, once we learned it all, and then I gave them the same exact assessment, it was unbelievable. And then later I, I gave them their pre-assessment and their post-assessment so they could see all the growth that they had made. That was really cool. So even though the language was difficult, I, I loved it because those were the terms they were going to learn. Like what is green stormwater infrastructure? I don't know. <laughs> so that was really fun. I think that's great that you gave them the permission to say, I don't know that. I think it took me till getting my master's degree somebody <laughs> to say, you know, it's, it's okay to say you don't know, you know, yeah. or something like that. Um, but so, you know, one of the things we did do to adapt the curriculum is we actually changed up. Now we have a younger student version of the pre and post assessment and an older student and the oh. we moved the blanks into the older student and we have a matching terms to definition for the younger students to oh, try to get at that a little bit. That is interesting. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I think that was pretty much it. But I did wonder how, if people have suggestions or tips on how to get a garden or whatever your project is maintained. So I know some people did projects in other schools or other areas like Echo who, or the Rubenstein Lab, who maintains that? That's a good question. That uh, is anybody? Oh, sorry, go ahead. 
I was just going to ask if any of the, the participants have ideas for that, whether it's echo or, or otherwise. I, I know um, I was talking with Tom DiPietro, who works at the city of South Burlington, and they just installed a number of wetland areas, stormwater um, natural areas, and they actually hired a um, landscaping company to maintain that wow. because there's so much. And he said, you know, his staff don't know how to maintain it. So they hired professionals to do that. Um, Ashley, what were you going to say? Sorry. I was just going to say that I know that part of that project is Stephanie Hurley's research. So that um, she was in, heavily involved in the design process, but, um, and it was a, they contracted with a landscape company to, I bl am blinking on the name, but um, that did the installation and then d now does the maintenance on that project specifically. And I think, um, you know, that question, Ruth, that you have about maintenance is a big one right now that folks are trying to grapple with at both, you know, kind of the state level, but also local municipalities trying to figure out after they install these, you know, these practices, who is taking care of them? What is the, what are the skills needed? And then what's the cost and kind of commitment to doing that? And so I think that's a, that's a, a great question. And I think folks are kind of figuring that out individually at, at sites, but um, I know we have a few folks in the audience that might have some other examples or ideas on um, maintenance. I don't know if anyone wants to throw their hand up. I can toss the mic your way. If you don't know where the hand raising is, I think on your panels is at the bottom of the participant panel at the bottom left. Mm -hmm. I think it should be, you can also just throw your name in the chat if you can't, um, if that, if you're not. Colleen, Colleen oh, raise your hand. Colleen. Okay, here we go. So another opportunity might be uh, master gardeners have to put in oh. X number of hours after they complete their program and they might be able to help out. Nice. Good idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thanks, Colleen. Yep. If there's a grant available, um, that sparked an idea in my mind. We have um, a fellow, Justin Geibel, from the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps, and I know um, a project, um, there's another, there's other conservation corps in the state where there, if there's funding available to support these conservation corps, they can sometimes be the ones who are maintaining projects uh, like rain gardens or um, other kinds of green infrastructure projects that need plants maintained. Will you share that grant information, Chris? Oh, so I'm meaning if, if there is a grant available, but so I'll, I'm going to, oh. Colleen, Colleen, do you want to mention the grants that are open right now through Basin Program? Uh, sure. Whoops. You're good. Oh, okay. I'm good to go. <laughs> um, so Ruth, we do have uh, two that are open right now that might be of interest. Um, one probably isn't quite as applicable because you're not currently in the classroom. It's a a uh, professional development mini grant for educators who are teaching about the watershed. Oh. So maybe some of your colleagues might have an interest. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are about $14,000 in that fund. Wow. And the grants can go up to $1,000. Uh, so that's one. And the other is um, we have our education and outreach grants open from the Basin program right now. Chris is a member of our committee as well. Uh, but those are evaluated, let me see, the, the closing deadline for those is December 21st, and they can be grants up to uh, $10,000. I'd be happy to chat more with you offline about that if it's easier. Okay. Um, but you know, grants that are small, looking for signage, things like that, are often the first to get filled because reviewers realize they're not coming in for the maximum. Um, so two, two opportunities to think about. Thank you. Thanks, Colleen. You're welcome. Right, and for folks that are attending, I did just, I just went to the Basin program and I pulled up their RFPs and grants right now. So if you click on that link that I just put in, that will take you to the page and it has the ENO grants that Colleen just talked about as well as the educator mini grants. So those are both in there as well as um, some professional development mini grants. So feel free to check those out. Anyone else want to have some ideas in terms of how do we maintain these kinds of gardens? Ideas from your, your experiences? The garden we planted is very small, so it's easy enough for me to pop down 
but I'm still here. But nobody wanted to take it over from my school. Like no other teacher wanted it. So that's something that it's, it's best to do with kids, obviously, but I don't know. That's, that would be a wish. So if I were still there, I would have them help maintain it. But we did put in mulch, so there wasn't much weeding to do. So that really helped a lot. So uh, one small. thing that the Basin program and then Sea Grant are working on is a high school stewardship program. And I'm just wondering if there might be an opportunity within that where some of the high school students who are earning their stewardship, I don't know what you call it, certificate, might be able to to volunteer and the I think the challenge is it's a it's geographically specific yeah. right so if, if they couldn't get down to Starksboro but um, that could be a an option the other thing uh, that I would suggest is the scouts uh, both the boy scouts and girl scouts have uh, like the gold award for instance uh, or the um, uh, eagle scout where the they're doing service projects so it could be that, that there's something there, or even for a badge, a troop might come in and volunteer their time uh, to maintain a space, uh, like, a, like a garden, like a community garden or a cool. um, pollinated garden. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. If there's not other questions, I I know we can we can keep chatting or we can we can not and um, let yeah, great suggestion coming in the chat box right now from Tammy, and Tammy's saying perhaps National Honor Society, who also um, it gets involved in some of those um, oh, yeah. community-based projects. I think that's a great idea, and I think, um, Tammy, that's also spot on, again, with integrating high school students into this somehow to create a little um, partnership and continue learning. Perhaps someday those students that planted the um, garden yeah. will be the ones in high school maintaining it. So That is a great idea. Love that's it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's all kinds of service groups right with within the yeah. high schools and the honor society is a, a excellent one thanks tammy yeah yeah that's awesome cool okay well thank you again ruth so much for sharing oh. this and thanks to everybody for having yeah. conversing with us uh at, afterwards um